Welcome everyone to Granary Church Online. It's so great to have you here. We do wish we could be gathering in person, but thanks for joining us this way. You might know someone who would really enjoy this service together. So why don't you invite them along? Just click in the chat to invite them, or you can send them a text message or share the YouTube link. Uh, we'd, we'd love for someone else that you know to join today. Now let's worship together. I encourage you to be singing and uh, let's praise God.
from Proverbs 1. We cross the threshold of true knowledge when we live in obedient devotion to God. Stubborn know-it-alls will never stop to do this, for they scorn true wisdom and knowledge. This is a time where we're, so many of us are locked down and an amazing time to spend time with the Lord. It says here that we cross the threshold of true knowledge when we live in obedient devotion to God. Um, an amazing time to spend time with our Father. And um, I encourage you to be doing that, um, even if you're working from home, to use that time where you'd be driving to work to spend time with the Lord in devotion to Him. And, uh, and let's just see what he would say to each one of us as we give him that time each day. Well, it's great to have you here uh, on Granary Church Online. Welcome again. And uh, if you're new, then uh, we'd love to hear from you. Just uh, click on the button in the chat there to say, I'm new, and we'd love to connect with you. And, uh, and everyone else, why don't you say hi in the chat? Uh, we'd love to hear from you and where you're watching. All right, we've got a whole bunch of things happening, so let's check out what's on. Hey church, this is Rachel. Here's what's on at The Granary. At The Granary Church, we absolutely love our VIPs. And even though our in-person gatherings are on hold for the moment, our community is still very much connected. We've moved our content online as well to be able to access. This week, we're recording a podcast with our very own Lynn Brown, which will be available later on this week via the podcast platform. If you have any questions or you need more information, contact the church office to see how you can get access to this content. Do you know someone doing it tough during the COVID lockdown? If you do, we'd love to invite you to tell them about the River Cafe at the Granary Church, where they can pick up a free frozen meal or two throughout the week. The cafe is open from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., Monday to Friday, and fresh meals are made on Tuesdays, which is a great time to come and pick one up before the 2 p.m. close. The Granary Food Care Centre on 58 Maitland Road, Mayfield, is also open during the lockdown. The centre provides free frozen meals, bread, very cheap groceries, and personal care items. The centre is open from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Tuesdays to Fridays. This term in Granary Youth is all about living with the power and authority the Holy Spirit brings. This Friday night, we're going live on Instagram with Ryan Zweigart at 5.30. Ryan's a great preacher and he's going to be unpacking Matthew 28 with us. So don't forget this Friday, September 3rd at 5.30 live on Instagram. See you there. If you need any more information, you can call the church office, check out our social media platforms or head to the church website. Take care and have a safe week. Hey. Hi, hey. Land Chops. Hey. Hey, Deb. How are you? Oh, it's great to see you. Uh, yep, it's great to see you too. Hey, there are some people here that are watching that don't know you. Oh. So this is Lamb Chops. We met last year uh, in COVID when we did some uh, cooking demos, didn't we, for granary kids? Yeah. Yep. So... We're here, I've invited you to um, just have a little chat about, I've got some exciting news. <gasps> oh, does it involve food? Not this time, oh. not this time. So my news is this, Lamb mm -hmm. Chop. So I've actually, I have been in hospitality for 25 years, oh. 25 years, right? So, mm -hmm. but it's time God's calling me out. God's calling me out to into a new area, um, which is actually around supporting and serving in a different way. So supporting um, people and families with uh, challenges, life challenges like and disabilities and just areas of support. So that's what's happening. He's calling oh. me out. So you're leaving, but, but no, you're no, no, part no. of the flock here, Deb. Yes, I'm, I'm not leaving. Oh. I'm not leaving the church, oh. not at all. So I'm actually, um, he's, I, I would never leave this church. This is my family. This is my flock. And you know, Lamb Chops, yeah. the granary have been a really, really important part of my life and, mm. and me for too. me and my sons. And uh, they really turned up when I needed and we needed help. Mm. And so my heart is so much for this, this church and for the family. So um, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. In fact, 
it's really exciting what is to come, mm. what is to come. And um, I am passionate about serving mm. and, and serving in this church. And so uh, God is going to, um, he's leading me into uh, an area um, that I'm not entirely sure of just yet, but wait okay. and see, hey? Oh, well, wow, you've come so far in your journey, Deb. And um, do you know what? We love you so much. We do. Mm. We do. Thank you, thank you. What's next? Well, what's next? Well, firstly, the team at the cafe is still going to be here and they're going to be doing a great job. We've got an awesome team, all the staff, and that will just build. Um, but I'm actually, yeah, as I said, it's, it's time for me to move out of that space. But I want to I wanna say thank you. I want to say thank you to everybody. Say thank you to um, all the people that I've met and uh, that I've served through the cafe and served in ministry and people who don't even know the Lord yet mm. who come in. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, oh look, so it isn't a goodbye, no. but there are so many people that will just want to thank you. And so I'm the first and I want to say thank you for always knowing how to make my lamy latte order <laughs> and for those beautiful smiles and for your prayers. Yep. And bring it on, Deb. Whatever Amen. is next. That's Amen. It. Yes, that's it. Thank you, Lamb Chops. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks so much, Deb. We are going to miss you. And uh, thank you for all that you give here. It's been incredible. And uh, we love you so much. And it's, I'm just glad that you're still going to be around. Um, now, next week, um, we're having Father's Day, which is going to be fantastic. And uh, it'll be online. And we're just looking forward to celebrating dads. And one thing that we want to do is if you have a photo of your dad during lockdown, doing whatever, if he's got a project that he's been doing or if he's just working at the desk, we want some lockdown photos of dads. So just send them in to hello at granary.org.au and uh, we'll, we'll have a look at those next week uh, during our Father's Day service. Um, it's going to be a great time together. We're going to hear from the youth singing a song and, um, and we're going to hear from the kids as well. Uh, so it'll be a great time together. Invite your dad along um, and it's, yeah, they'll be online. So wherever they are, they can watch it anywhere in the world. Um, so I encourage you to be inviting people to that next week. All right, it's now time to give and uh, you can see the different ways on the screen of how to give. And, uh, and now is such an important time to be sowing into what God is doing through the church. And, uh, and it's exciting. So I encourage you now to do that. Um, we know that many of you are already direct debiting, and that's fantastic. And uh, let me pray now for our giving. God, we just thank you uh, for what you're doing here in the church, Lord. And um, yeah, just I thank you that we can continue to worship you, continue to go draw closer to you and learn more of you, Father, in this time, even online. And, uh, and right now, we just sow into this ministry, into this church. And in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to hear now from Theo Rule. So uh, why don't you lean into this message as we continue our challenge on extending grace. Isaiah 53, verse 3 to 7. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. 
That's a prophecy that was written about Jesus uh, hundreds of years before he was even born. And it's quite a sober picture that we have, really, if we think about um, the fact that this is, this is a, a picture of the encounter that God had with mankind. God comes into human form, and what's his experience like as he interacts on a human level with, with mankind? It's this image that we get. He's despised, he's rejected, he's beaten, and ultimately he's killed. And that's not just um, <laughs> unfortunate. That's, that is the um, inevitable interaction of God with mankind. Because mankind ha- is, is, has a disposition, sadly, towards hatred and violence. That's what human nature is like. Human nature um, exhibits hatred in every period of history, in every context, we can see it. Um, so it would be easy for us to kind of just look at this as a, as a moment in time. But the fact is, is that we have to look at ourselves. You know, um, we could even point to um, situations in other parts of the world where we can see hatred and violence um, on display in, in very real terms. But we don't need to do that because we can look very clearly within our own context and we can see that human nature has got this tendency towards hatred and violence. Um, we see it um, in children. You know, even this week when I was um, out on my balcony, I could look off into the distance and see two kids, I think, I presume they were brothers, um, on a trampoline and they were um, having fun on the trampoline, but something went wrong. I don't know, someone accidentally stepped on the other person or something like that, and all of a sudden it snapped and it turned into violence. And one of the boys was suddenly whacking the other, the brother, the brother was crying and trying to hit him back and then the two were separated. Um, and I'm sure any of us who have been on a trampoline with our siblings at some point in our lives can remember experiences like that when suddenly violence takes over and, um, and animosity even towards our own family. Um, and we know in children, um, unfortunately, that, that um, bullying can happen in school and even in online school, Bullying happens in an online context, and I've um, seen some of the, the horrible ways that, that children um, can talk to each other in, in when they're chatting online or um, whatever it might be. Some of you would probably have personal stories about that, which are um, incredibly painful. Um, children don't need to be taught how um, to show animosity. Somehow, they, um, they develop that themselves without being taught, but... I don't want to just lay the blame on children because we know that adults can be no better, even in in an online context. I mean, how many of us have seen on Facebook or something like that, um, people talking to each other in a way which is just really disgraceful, Um, hiding really behind their keyboards um, to, to, to try and tear other people down, to make other people look bad, to try and discredit other people, um, to, to act in a way which is really, if we're honest, anything but loving. Um, and sometimes this um, this animosity, this hatred, can be more than just words. Sometimes it does play out in physical terms. Um, uh, and um, we know that in Australia, we've got such a problem with domestic violence. Uh, um, I won't rattle off statistics to you right now, but but um, I'm sure most of us are aware that that there is a real issue with domestic violence. Um, in, in our country, and, and I'm sure it's not at all helped by situations of lockdown. Um, and some of these examples that I'm giving can seem quite extreme. And, um, and so we go, well, that's, you know, I'm not like that. I don't, I'm, I'm, don't, I'm not violent towards anybody. I, I'm not, I'm, I don't cyber bully, or, you know, um, I stay away from social media and all of those sorts of things. But we can also... We can also demonstrate this animosity just quite simply in the way that we talk about other people. Um, one of the classic places that I think we see that in our context is in the workplace, when 
where there's a little bit of character assassination that goes on in the way that we talk about other people. You know, it can just be the subtlest little thing that just, you know, makes sure that we can keep our own reputation um, whilst letting other people know what someone else is really like so we can just try and tear them down a little bit in other people's minds because, well, well, why are we like that? Why are we like that? I mean, you know, you might be thinking, oh, sheesh, Theo, this is... This is pretty, you know, pretty harsh way to, to begin a sermon, particularly in this um, challenge of extend grace. But I think what the scriptures are expressing to us is that until we take an honest look at what human nature is like, at what our own nature can be like, um, then we then we will miss the profundity of the story of God's grace, which is extended to us, because often we can just be like, "Oh, we're all right," you know, "we don't, we don't, I'm fine." But until we we actually look at what human nature and our own nature has a tendency towards, which is hatred and animosity, uh, we we will we will um, take for granted the grace of God. So it's important that we understand what human nature is truly like. Now. Why do humans have this tendency towards fighting, towards hatred, towards violence? Is it because um, we just need to become more civilised? Is it because we are, are, um, are animals and we've got animal instincts and, uh, and we, just, we, need to, we need to refine ourselves? Because um, if we look at it from a purely secular point of view, that's pretty much all we can reduce it to is that, oh, well... You know, it's just, um, it's, it's, you know, a combination of desires and neurons firing and all of these sorts of things that, you know, if we can just create a more cultivated, civilised society, then we'll be able to, to lessen um, the, the impact of fighting, of hatred, of, of animosity. Um, but somehow I think we know that that isn't fully getting to the heart of what's going on here in, in, in human nature. And we know that when someone treats us with hatred, if someone is against us, if someone is warring with us, that it's not simply a case of, oh, they're just, um, they're, uh, they're be- they were unable to do it. They were just behaving, you know, they were, they were um, just behaving uh, the way that um, that their body was um, was telling them to do. That doesn't really get to the heart of the issue. And actually, the story that we see in Scripture of... Um, of what is at the root of this problem with with mankind is not um, because we are behaving like animals, but actually it's because we're trying to behave like gods. That's what the scripture tells us, is that it's our desire to, to make ourself God that um, causes us to have, have hatred, to have fighting, and we see that at the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis, in the story of the fall. Because um, prior to the fall, God creates this garden, this paradise called Eden with Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve live in a world without violence, without fighting, without hatred. And they live in a world where they have perfect communion with God. And, um, and, and everything is theirs. But there is one tree placed in the garden which they um, are forbidden, which they're not allowed to to partake of of its fruit. And it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is really perplexing at first glance because you kind of go, well, what's the... What's the problem with having the knowledge of good and evil? I mean, that, surely that would seem like a good thing. But what is at the heart of it is that when... Adam and Eve chose to take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They are saying, we're not going to respect God's position as God anymore in our position as human. We want to take on the position of God. And we want no longer for God to be the, the um, arbiter of, of good and evil. We want to be the arbiter of good and evil ourselves. And so from that moment on, humankind become judge and jury of their own lives and no longer leave um, judgment up to God. And um, the result of that is that our judgment as humans of other people is imperfect and it's self-centered. So we look at the way that other people behave towards us, at the way that, that our life has gone, and we become judge and jury of the world around us, of the people in our lives. And um, and we don't respond with a righteous judgment. Instead, instead our tendency is to respond in revenge. 
Something was done badly to me, and so I want to get that person back. Or if it's not to get that person back specifically, we respond with just a general disposition of bitterness. I was dealt a hard blow in life, and so I'm going to generally, if I can't get back at that person, I'm just going to get back at life itself, at the world or at God, by, by being bitter and, and, and feeling a sense of righteousness because you kind of go, well, I, I, I've earned my bitterness because this was done to me, and so I, I, I am justified in, in having this disposition towards the, the world generally. And when we start to adopt these attitudes, the end result is always violence. And we can see that very starkly in the Genesis story because um, Adam and Eve are then kicked out of the garden, of course, and they have sons, Cain and Abel. And I want to read that story to you um, from Genesis chapter 4. It says, Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The issue here is that Cain was not respecting God's judgment. Now, what I find most intriguing about this story is that I don't think it's entirely clear why Abel's offering was accepted and why Cain's was was rejected. Now, I know that some commentaries will say, will will make up a reason for it, but I don't think that the story is that explicit as to why his was accepted, Abel's was accepted, and Cain's wasn't. I mean, for starters, it says that Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. So Cain wasn't able to bring forward a meat offering because he didn't work with flocks, he worked with the soil. He was only able to bring forward... um, what he had, which was which was produce. So um, it can't be just that. Now, you know, there might be some reason about, oh, he wasn't bringing forward the, the first fruits or something like that. Um, but I think the bottom line of it is, is that sometimes God has a judgment about a situation which um, we don't fully understand. And, uh, and sometimes we would like to fully understand God's judgment. And... Um, in, in some cases in scripture, it's, you know, God's judgment about something is fully unpacked and other times it isn't. There's an element of mystery about it. And in that moment, we can choose to go, I, I am going to respect God as, as, as judge. And even if I don't fully understand, I'm going to his, respect his judgment. Or we, we can say, no, I, I don't respect that. And what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to become God now because I believe that my judgment is better than his. And so I'm going to take judgment now into my own hands. And we do so when we respond to a situation in revenge or in bitterness. And Cain here in killing his brother is responding um, really in revenge, I suppose, to his brother or in just in in, in bitterness towards um, God, towards life in general, or or perhaps um, an element of both. And as I said, the result ultimately is always violence. And we can see that here. And so often we can be like that. Instead of trusting God's judgment, we decide to take matters into our own hands because we think we know what's best. But we can see what happens. God says to Cain, now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And here in this story, right at the beginning of scripture, um, a 
A pattern is set up for mankind. We get this picture of mankind becoming a restless wanderer on, on the earth um, under this curse because of um, our rejection of God as judge and our decision to become judge and jury of our own life. And, um, and the fact is, is that sometimes we, we become addicted to being right. And in our, in our addiction to being right, it doesn't matter the carnage that we create in the world around us. That, that no longer becomes important because our value has instead become our own power. John Milton, um, in Paradise Lost, puts it like this. This is um, Lucifer. So Satan is talking in, in, in this allegory, Paradise Lost. And, and Lucifer says, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And what's being implied here is that when we decide I'm going to be God, what we create for us is hell. We create hell in out in the world around us, but we don't care because we get to be God. We get to be in charge um, rather than coming under the reign of God. See, in choosing power instead of truth, we create hell for us to live in. And that's the narrative of the Bible is that as humans go on, Increasingly, we see violence continues and it grows. Hatred grows. Animosity grows. And hell reigns on earth. But the good news is of Scripture is that God comes down in the person of Jesus into the center of that hell. And we see um, the the meeting point of that in his crucifixion, which was um, prophesied in that passage that I read earlier from Isaiah. And so I want to look now um, at what we see in, in that meeting point where heaven meets earth on the cross. And we're going to do that by just looking um, at an aspect of the crucifixion narrative from each of the four Gospels. And then we'll be done. It says in Mark 15 beginning at verse 29. So Jesus is hanging on the cross and it says, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from this cross that we may see him and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now, what's going on here? Because, of course, you know, 2,000 years after Jesus, we look back at the story of Jesus giving him his life um, as a... Um, as a noble thing, as like a glorious act. And we see that retrospectively. In fact, you probably don't even need to be a Christian to, to understand the story in, in those terms because our, our culture has been so um, influenced by, by the Bible. But human nature has not always liked that. It's not always in our nature to um, value self-sacrifice um, and weakness. In fact, right here, People are hurling insults at him because his weakness and his his self-sacrifice is, in fact, despised because it wasn't to them a value. Um, What they wanted to see was revenge. What they're trying, what they would like to see is, hey, if this guy really is God, he's going to come down from the cross and he's going to grab that hammer and he's going to start bashing it over the heads of the Roman centurions and he's going to have a glorious victory through revenge, through human revenge, because that is what was valued to them. Violence and revenge. Get one better. One up them. Come come back at them, play with them at their own game. And it's interesting because that's exactly what Satan tempts Jesus with when he's in the desert. He tempts him with human power, with human victory, just lay claim on the kingdoms of of the earth in human terms. But Jesus is the one person in history who resists that temptation at every point along the way. But for the people at the time, it wasn't a value. Um, Jonathan Swift, who was the 17th, uh, 17th century um, essayist, Christian essayist, said, Whoever excels in what we prize appears a hero in our eyes. So Jesus is 
death on the cross at the time, this wasn't to them some great heroic act. To them, it was despised because that wasn't their, their they didn't value uh, self-sacrifice and um, weakness. That wasn't the culture. And what happens is that Jesus actually comes down in the middle of that and he changes everything forever. Let's look at Luke now. Luke 23, beginning at 33. It says, When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then the centurions divided up his clothes by casting lots. Jesus comes right down into the center of this cycle of hell and hatred and bitterness and revenge. And instead of being like, I'm going to one up them, because he could have. He had the power to be like, right, I'm going to absolutely decimate these people. I mean, that's what people wanted to see God do, to come down and to lay waste and to, to destroy and just add to the carnage, but one up it. But instead, Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them. And we have to understand how profoundly that is because this cycle that had been going on for thousands and thousands of years suddenly comes to a screeching halt in that moment when Jesus, instead of taking the revenge, which was rightly his, chooses an act of grace and forgiveness. And that changed the course of human history from that moment on. It's expressed clearly in um, a book, which I know a lot of people in our church um, have read and, um, and gotten a lot from, which is called The Book That Made Your World, which looks at the impact of the Bible in history by Vishal Mangalwadi. And he says, he talks about this moment and he says, classical heroism clashed with the Bible because while the former valued power, Christ's heroism prized truth. Other kings and kingdoms fostered heroic deeds by cultivating racial, geographic, linguistic, religious class or caste pride and hatred. Jesus made love the supreme value of the kingdom of God. This love was not sentimentalism. It went beyond loving one's neighbor as oneself. Its supreme manifestation was the cross sacrificing oneself for others, including one's enemies. It's the complete opposite of what was begun at the fall, which was revenge, hatred, bitterness, animosity, becomes self-sacrifice for one's enemies. Let's look at John now. John uh, John 19, beginning at verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, And so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he'd received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, why do they say gave up his spirit rather than he died? It's because Jesus is, you know, the whole time, this is a voluntary act. He wasn't incarcerated because he had no other option. He willingly put himself into the hands of the soldiers. He willingly went through all of it. At any moment, he could have come out of it, but he willingly died. It wasn't that he was trapped. He willingly gave up his spirit and died for us. And in that moment, the curse of the tree of knowledge of us being judge and jura and creating this never ending cycle of revenge and violence and hatred is finished. And we no longer have to live under its dictates because of that moment on the cross. Jesus looks at that cycle of human sin and hatred and he says, it is finished. It's done. We no longer have to live in that anymore. And God said to Cain, Be careful because sin is crouching at your door, ready to pounce. And we continue to find ourselves in situations where people treat us wrong, where life treats us badly, deals us a hard blow. And the temptation for revenge and for bitterness is always there, crouching, 
ready to pounce. And we now are able to look at that and say, it is finished. I'm, I am bringing about an end to this cycle of hatred and animosity. Matthew 27, 50 to 54. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. What's going on here? What is going on is that the curse which was laid upon mankind from um, the, our fall at the tree of uh, knowledge is being reversed. And what brought death is now being reversed and life is actually beginning to happen. It's like, do you remember when you're, in a, you know, you're a kid and you were with your friends and you're in a pool? And you start to create a whirlpool. Everyone goes in one direction and you start walking and it gets faster and faster and faster. That's like the, the cycle of human animosity and hatred and violence, which, um, which had happened, which had you know, just got faster and faster through mankind and culminated in the point of, of us taking God and killing him and mo- mocking him and spitting on him and, and um, beating him. It culminates in that point and Jesus says, it is finished and he gives up his spirit. And it's like that moment when you suddenly stop in the whirlpool and everything halts. And then you start moving in the opposite direction. It's like that. The curse was reversed in that moment. People started coming to life. The curtain which separated us from God is torn open. It's And it says, when the centurion and those who were with who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened. They were terrified and they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. In that moment, human history was turned around. The very soldiers, the very Roman soldiers who had killed him suddenly acknowledged in that moment, he was the son of God. Such is the power of grace in forgiveness in the face of hatred. Um, I want to read an, another passage from the book that made your world. It says that following the New Testament's emphasis on the cross, the preachers preached about the cross, the painters painted it, the poets wrote poems about it, and the singers sang about the glories of the old rugged cross. Carpenters and masons made so many crosses that the cross became the very motif of Christian civilization. Architects placed the cross at the centerpiece of the stained glass windows of their churches and cathedrals. As masses sat meditating on the meaning of the cross, it changed Western consciousness from within. A brutal triumphant knight could no longer be an inspiring Christian hero. He was the very opposite of a crucified, humiliated Messiah who died so that others might live. And slowly from that moment, the world began to to change. Our values began to change. Christianity went from being despised, from Christ being killed by um, the Romans, to becoming the religion of Rome. And then eventually the, the, the culture of Jesus has gone on to affect everything. Such is the power of grace in the face of hatred. And because Jesus in that moment decided to change it, to reverse the curse, to say, Father, forgive them, to say it is finished to that cycle, we are now able, when we look at the cross, we are able to do the same. You might find yourself in a situation where there's hatred around you, where there's violence, where there's animosity, where you see sometimes, you know, like, and particularly some of these things can really come out in the hotbed of lockdown. You look in the face of those things and you have to be honest that you, every time that you choose revenge, when you choose bitterness, when you choose to to become judge, rather than allowing God to be judge, you are continuing that cycle yourself. We have to be honest with ourselves. And if we choose in that moment, instead of playing into it, Instead of being judged, instead of taking revenge, instead of being bitter, we choose 
grace. When we choose grace, we are able to reverse the effects of that, to actually undo the curse, such as the power of grace, to bring situations back to life. And who knows what the end of that could be, because in that moment we choose no longer to be God and we allow God to be God and to change situations. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to extend grace into situations of hatred and violence, God. We need to be people who will follow your example, who go, because of your justice, which was perfectly executed on the cross, I'm now free to look in the face of these situations and say, I'm not going to be judge anymore. God, you are judge and I am free to extend grace, to stop that cycle and to bring dead situations back to life. So God, we just want your incredible power of grace to flood through all of us, to change the culture of our family, of our workplace, of our church, of our community and of our city, Lord, as we um, are people who just come in the face of it and say, you know what, it's finished. It's finished. I'm not playing into that anymore because God, you are judge and I can extend grace. I ask all of this in your name. Amen. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. If you'd like prayer for anything, then you can click in the chat there and, uh, and someone will connect with you. Or you can email us at hello at granary.org.au. We'd love to pray for you. If you'd just like a conversation, then, then we'd love for one of our pastoral team to connect with you. So, so just email us. Um, that would be great. And um, next week, don't forget that we're having a great Father's Day celebration. So make sure you invite someone along to that. It's going to be a great time together. And uh, let me pray. God, we just thank you for today. I thank you for what you're doing in us as you take us on this journey of extending grace to one another. And uh, yeah, we thank you for what you're going to do in this whole community, Lord, as you release that, that power of forgiveness and, and the, the grace that you've shown us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. This is my confession I lay it at your feet My heart has been far from you When you're all I need Pride is my admission Through all my words and deeds My own selfish ambition When you're all I need Turn my eyes upon you. I turn my back on all my history of wrongs. Turn my eyes upon you. you